cool. And what we like to do is we like to start our study of God's Word with a little story like this one. It was such a simple question, a question that you think that you would have an answer for immediately. See there, Jesus stands before his disciples and he asks, who do the people say that the son of man is? And some said it was, you know, it was John the Baptist and some said Elijah and others said Jeremiah. And then he asked him, but who do you say? that I am. You see, Jesus is asking us this question, and today you can answer. Jesus is the son of the living God. Who else? My king, my hero, Jesus, the son of God. You are the Lord Almighty. You are my savior. He's the son of the living God. He's Lord of all. You are my Lord and master. You are Savior of the world. Jesus is my light and he's the way and the truth and the light. Jesus is my savior. My savior? Jesus is the world to me. Jesus is my savior. Jesus is my Lord and master, my Lord. Jesus is my savior and Lord of all. Friends, it's the Lord of my life, my savior. The son of God and everything. Lord and savior. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, creator of heaven and earth. Amen. If Jesus stood before you and asked, who do you say that I am? How would you answer? Who do you say that I am? You know, this is the question that is still being asked. And what I want to share with you this morning is a way to answer this question when it comes up, because I have news for you. Just because you might say in your heart that you do not have the gift of evangelism does, does not give you any excuse. I've tried to use this excuse many times because I don't believe I have the gift of evangelism. I've been called to be a teacher, I, I, I dive into the Word, but somebody like Greg Laurie can preach about their grocery list and 5,000 people get saved. And I don't understand how that works. I mean, literally, I mean, he just, he just stands up there and starts talking and people get saved. I, I don't get it because he's got a special gift. My gift is not in that area. But I, I can tell you this, that if you are a believer, you are a Christian this morning, the Holy Spirit resides in you. And the Bible says that no one comes to the Son of God, no one comes to Jesus unless the Father, unless Father God draws him to the Son. So it, it doesn't matter if you have the gift of evangelism or not. If you are seated around the Easter table, because that might happen this very day, or Thanksgiving, or some other family event. And how many of you know that there's going to be that one cousin that's going to give you grief because you are a Jesus freak? How many of you have this cousin? Okay, okay. if you don't, I do. We're going to call him Cousin Plato because he is an internet philosopher. He read it on the internet, therefore it must be true. How many of you know about this guy? All right, and he's going to get around that table and he's going to give you some grief about being a Christian, about being, you know, kind of a uh, you know, Jesus freak, being whacked out. So you might say Yeshua is your Lord and your King, but those words are not going to mean a whole lot to Cousin Plato because he read on the internet in the New York Times this morning that we should abandon the vengeful, hateful God of the Bible. That was in the New York Times today. That's what they're going to read. They read that on the internet and they think, well, it must be true because it's out there on the internet. And 
So this conversation is going to come up and God's going to place an opportunity right in front of you in order to make your testimony, make your stand. But how do you do this? Because you may say, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I don't know all the apologetics and all the answers. I, you know, I, I study the Bible, but I don't have it all memorized. And, and, and it's intimidating. It can be scary, but I want to take that away from you today. Because the truth of the matter is, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. It does not say faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by your testimony or your ability to answer questions, or how much you know about evolution and creation. It does not say that. It says it comes by the Word. And in other words, it's the Holy Spirit working on a person's heart because the Bible tells us that within every human being, there is an innate, built-in knowledge that God exists and that they, they need to know Him. It is there. It is in every human being. Now, they deny it. They suppress it. They try to sear their own conscience to get away from it, but it is there. And the Holy Spirit will work on a person at, uh, on his own timetable. You don't know where you are in that process. Could you be part of planting a seed or watering a seed or actually harvesting today? You don't know. But as a believer, you have a responsibility in order to share it. And one of the best ways you can do that, listen, is simply have a passage that you're ready to share. And I recommend Acts chapter 2, which is what we're going to go and take a look at today. And we're going to go through it the same way we normally do. This is what we do every weekend, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We go into it. We give history and language and all this in order to give you a practical use for something. And the very first thing that you can do with cousin Plato, listen to me on Plato. How many of you know he's an idiot? Okay. So what you need to do is let him talk first. What you do is you go, really? Tell me more about that. And just let him go. Make sure that Cousin Plato is able to talk for 15, 20 minutes at least. And it does not matter how crazy it is. Do not rebut. Do not interrupt. Do not argue. And if he's telling you that he is utterly convinced that the universe was created by blind crickets in association with UFOs, it does not matter. Just go, really? Tell me more about that. Okay, just let him talk. And there's a reason behind it. There's a strategy to this. Because when he finally runs out of hot air, you can say, you know what? Did you notice that I did not interrupt you even one time? Did you notice that I gave you the floor because I had enough respect to understand what you believe, whether I believe it or not? Well, yeah. Well, wouldn't you want to be tolerant? Start nodding your head like this. How many of you know that people in this culture do not like the idea of being called intolerant? So you say, so since I gave you 15 or 20 minutes, shouldn't you give me the same amount of time? Well, okay, great. We're going to read some Bible. And you go to Acts chapter 2. Now, since you have a cell phone, you know, you can get on it. You can be ready to go. You don't have to pull out a Bible that's big enough to choke a mule. You can just get on, you know, your, your phone, which probably might be big enough to choke a mule too, but still. And what you're going to do is you're going to begin to explain to Cousin Plato why you believe, what you believe, but you're going to use the Word of God to do it. Now, the first thing that you're going to explain is you're going to explain, look, I don't believe what I believe because our grandma does or because we grew up a certain way. You're in this family. You know what it's like. That's not my reasoning. My reasoning is because I thought this thing through. For example, the book of Acts is the most historically accurate document ever written in any language. So I'm going to believe what it has to say. In fact, historians study the book of Acts in order to learn how to be historians. It's never been shown to be an error. They use it as a guide map for archaeologists in the Middle East. All right, so I can trust what it says. Not only that, the evidence is overwhelming. It was written prior to A.D. 64. So that's long before any kind of legend or myth or anything else could build up. In fact, the book of Acts almost certainly was a legal document that was written for the defense of the Apostle Paul when he was on trial for his life in Rome. Because he had to write down what 
happened. You're on trial. What happened? And he wrote a legal defense with, uh, Dr. Luke wrote it with him, and they, they wrote down. In fact, the first half is all about the other eyewitnesses and what they say happened. And then, then the second half is all, we did this, I did that, and we jumped on the ship, and we went here. It was all firsthand because Luke was there. So this is a very, very accurate document that you can trust. And it was, you know, we're going to start at Acts chapter 2 because this is written about 50 days after Yeshua was crucified on the cross. See, after Yeshua was crucified on the cross, you know, over 500 witnesses said, we saw him alive, we heard him, we laid hands on him, he rose from the dead. This was spreading all over Jerusalem at that time. Now, there were two feasts. Yeshua was crucified during the feast of Passover, just before the Passover Sabbath or Shabbat. Just before that, that's when he was crucified, and he rose from the dead on the first day of the week after that. Now, Passover is an important Jewish holiday, festival, feast, that was designed and intended for the people, the Hebrew people, to constantly, every year, remember that God spared them when they were in Egypt from all the plagues that were going on, especially the last plague. God passed over them. The judgment went on God's enemies, and the Jewish people were rescued from the land of Egypt. That's what Passover is all about. But, you know, 50 days after Passover, there's another feast because they were supposed to remember that and then 50 days later, they were supposed to remember all of God's blessings and it was called the Feast of Pentecost. The reason it was is the word Pentecost is a Greek word which means the 50th day. That's all it means. And so you can explain that to cousin Plato and then you can go on and start reading at verse 1. It says on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. So that means the people who had seen Yeshua die and rise again from the grave, they were all together in one place because they didn't, you know, what are we going to do now? We've seen Jesus rise from the dead. What do we do? So they were waiting there because Jesus himself told them, look, wait in Jerusalem until I pour out my Holy Spirit on you so that you'll be given power to be able to go and spread the message out from here. So they were waiting there. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So what we're looking at here is a miracle. It is a miracle. It's something that only God can do. Now, Cousin Plato is probably going to object right here and say he doesn't believe in miracles. You need to remind him, I didn't interrupt you. You don't get to interrupt me. Let me explain. You see, because miracles are not something that we should discount. Miracles are something that only the true God can do. Now, I know that most of us have been raised since we were this tall to believe that, well, we have to have a scientific or a natural explanation for absolutely everything. And the quote-unquote scientific people, they discount the idea of a supernatural God that can do miracles. They discount that out of the gate. And yet, these are the same people, the most popular Origin theory in the world today is called, how many of you have heard of it, the Big Bang Theory? How many of you have heard of this? Not the TV show, but the Big Bang Theory. Okay, what is the Big Bang Theory? If you went to public school, you probably heard about it. It goes like this. Once upon a time, all of the evidence says that there was absolutely nothing. There was no space, no time, no matter, no quantum fields, no fluctuations of any kind, no laws of physics, no laws of nature, absolutely nothing. And then all of a sudden, bang, there was absolutely everything that you see, including life itself. Now, 
when you consider all of that, I don't know about you, but that sounds like magic, not science. So why in the world would scientists... Now, any four-year-old can tell you that nothing can't do anything because it's no thing. How can no thing do something? It can't. A four-year-old can figure that out. So why are the world's greatest scientists, PhDs, and all of this stuff saying that the Big Bang Theory is probably, this is what happened. Because the evidence says so. When you look at the laws of thermodynamics, you look at the strong and weak nuclear force, you look at the balance, the anthropic principle of all the things that are happening in the universe, and you recognize that it's balanced on the head of a pen, that everything is so perfectly aligned that if it was off even by a billionth of a billionth percent, it would destroy everything in this universe. And yet it is perfectly balanced. It's called the anthropic principle. That means the man-centered principle. Because there's just no other way to explain it. The universe was built so that you would exist. And scientists know this. And so they came up with the Big Bang Theory because they don't want to admit God, so they just believe in nothing. How many of you know that doesn't make a whole lot of sense? And that is the reason, and you could point this out to Cousin Plato. You could say, look, this is the reason that hundreds, even thousands of scientists are abandoning neo-Darwinism and atheism in droves. They are now, all of them, just lots of them, are, are, are embracing what's called the theory of intelligent design. In fact, Dr. Stephen Meyer just wrote a book last year called, it's a bestseller, The Return of the God Hypothesis. I recommend you read it. Powerful book. And a lot... Now, these people are not becoming Christians. They certainly don't believe in the Bible. But they see the scientific evidence. You cannot have an effect like this universe without an adequate cause. And so that means that it can't be nothing because nothing can't do anything. There has to be a transcendent existence something from which everything else gets existence. It has to be a ground. And they, they, they recognize this. They see this scientifically, logically, philosophically. That's how it works. And because of that, it makes sense that there is a being who has no beginning and has no end. He does not owe his existence to anything or anyone. And everything that exists around you is already the greatest miracle you could ever even conceive of. This life came from nothing. Only a God who is greater than time, space, matter, the only a God who can build the laws of physics to hold everything together can account for that. And scientists are acknowledging it. They don't want to become Christians. They don't want to be moral. They don't, you know, many of them don't want to do any of those kinds of things. But they really don't have any choice if they're going to be intellectually honest. And you can go and and you can explain that. You can explain that the God who can create the heavens and the earth, he is the author of life. He certainly can raise the dead. And he can cause people to speak other languages when he wants to. Yes, that's a miracle, but it's not an unheard of miracle. Let's go on, verse 5. So at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. And they were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee. And yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Now, they didn't have signs that says, hi, my name is Joe and I'm from Galilee. I mean, that's not how they figured it out. They figured it out because while they were speaking other languages, they still had an accent that was distinctly from Galilee. And that's what was amazing then because back in those days, Galilee was Hicksville when it came to Israel. I mean, it really was. This is not, you intellectual giants did not come from Galilee in the first century and everybody knew it. Verse 9. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews, converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs. I mean, he's given us a list. This comes from the whole Roman Empire, which was gigantic. 
And, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things that God has done. So they stood there amazed. They were perplexed. What can this mean? And they asked each other, uh, you know, but others in the crowd ridiculed them saying, they're just drunk, that's all. How many of you know that is a really lame excuse for what they're hearing? Because drunk people do speak other languages, but they are not real languages. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Some of you are going to, I've said that a few times. I've spoken that language. No, 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 don't, don't admit that. Okay, but anyway, the, the truth of the matter is, that's, they're drunk, that's all, is a lame excuse. It, it, it really is. It's trying to explain things away. Now, these Jewish people were from all over the empire. And, you know, they traveled weeks in order to get to Jerusalem. When they got there, you know, this might be the only time in their lives they get to have Passover in Jerusalem because they're coming all the way from Spain or some, somewhere. That, you know, that's what that list was all about. And yet, they get there and they hear about this miracle worker named Yeshua. I mean, the day before the Passover, a couple days before, He's coming into town, everybody's shouting, Hosanna, he's a prophet, ah, and then a few days later, they're shouting, crucify him, and you know, and the, the non-locals are going, I don't know who this guy is, but he totally ruined my vacation, I mean, you come all the way over here, everything's all about him, then they crucify him, and then a few days later, everybody's saying he rose from the dead, they're already freaking out, and then they hear a bunch of guys from Galilee from, you know, Hicksville Central in North Israel, and they, they can hear the language, and they're going, something's going on here. I mean, this is a miracle, and it, it's tough for them to explain. Kind of reminds me of a, of a story. When I was working in Amsterdam uh, with Youth with a Mission, I got to live in that city for a while, and we had uh, a place called the Samaritan's Inn. It was right across from Central Station, and in the heart of the, of the old section of Amsterdam, right at the head of the uh, red light district. And it was an op- we had an open service. It was constantly going on. So every night, there was somebody playing and singing and doing worship and, and having, you know, anybody could come in. That's what the Samaritan's Inn was all about. And uh, so we're in there, and this guy comes in, and one of, the guy, one of our guys was, up, was worshiping. He had his hands up in the air like this. And as he's worshiping and he's singing, he just starts spontaneously this this other language starts coming out of his mouth it sounded kind of like gibberish but you know whatever uh you know if, if, but the guy right behind him freaked out and turned around and ran out of the building scared to death what's with him you know what i mean well the next day this guy shows back up and he's got four of his friends and yeah, at first, you know, you're wondering, is, is this going to be a confrontation or something, you know? But he goes, well, I, I was in the church I was service last night, and you had your hands up in the air, and you're, you're speaking my language. He was from this little village in Syria who spoke this weird dialect that like 200 people in the world speak. And he said, yeah, and, and you were saying, go get my friends and come back because you would tell us how to be saved. And, and my, the guys that were able to lead them to Christ and they went back to Syria, who knows where that went? You know what I mean? But God is still in miracle business because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Peter steps forward with the 11 other apostles and he shouted at the crowd. Now let's kind of stop there for a sec. How many of you know that 50 days before Pete had really showed what a fool he could be. He had denied that he even knew Jesus. If anybody could have felt, I don't have the right to say anything, it was Pete. But he saw an opportunity and he went for it. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, he said what we're about to read. In the same way, my friend, if you are a believer and the Holy Spirit is in you and you are around that table and Cousin Plato brings it up, You need to step forward the way Peter did. And the easiest way to do that is to simply pull out Acts chapter 2 and say, let's go through this and explain it. Whether Cousin Plato gets it or not is irrelevant. Do what Peter did. Step forward. Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. He's going to explain it. 
These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming, because 9 o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. And you can stop right there and you can go, wait a second. It's not about when you're allowed to get drunk in, in the world. It's not like, okay, you can drink beer before 9 in the morning and you'll never get drunk. That's not what he's saying. He's pointing out evidence. You see, Jewish people did not eat or drink anything before 9 o'clock in the morning on feast days. And everybody knew it. So he's saying, look at the facts. Your, your explanation for this doesn't fit the facts. You see, the Bible is not ashamed to point at evidence, and you shouldn't either. When you get the opportunity, point out, no, that's silly. You're telling me cave crickets created the world? Well, who created the cave crickets? Come on. I mean, ask those questions. Challenge it. Don't be afraid. Peter wasn't. You shouldn't either. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy and I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke and the sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that, you know, what he's doing here is he's making an explanation and you need to do the same thing because he's pointing back to the book of Joel because the Jewish people would have recognized the book of Joel. Well, maybe cousin Plato won't because he doesn't know one end of the Bible from the other. And that's okay. What you need to do when you read this is explain what the last days means. Because the Bible tells us that God took on the form of a human being in the person of Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. And he came and offered himself as king and the people rejected him. He was crucified, but he rose again from the dead and he ascended into heaven, but he said to his followers, look, I'm coming back. And the Bible tells us that the last days are the days between when Jesus came the first time and when Jesus is coming the second time. We are in the last days. We have been for a long time. And, you know, Cousin Plato may say, well, that's kind of a lame excuse. It's been several thousand years. And you can say, yes, that's true. But Yeshua himself in Matthew chapter 24 said, I'm going to give you one of the signs that you'll know that the last days are coming to a close. And that sign is this. You're going to see the nation of Israel regathered as a nation, and it's going to happen in a day. Now, that was predicted 1,900 and some odd years ago. This is why, and you could say this, you know, listen, Plato, this is the reason I believe. It's not because uh, Grandma believes. It's because I've seen this prophecy. And that this kind of stuff was written down thousands of years before. See, the Jewish people were destroyed by Titus the Roman. Their country was obliterated. They were scattered to the ends of the earth. Most of them, except for a few scholars, no longer spoke Hebrew as a language. And to say this is a miracle is, is amazing because on May 14, 1948, in one day, the United Nations recognized Israel as a nation for the first time in over 1,900 years. And that was predicted by Yeshua himself. Not only was the nation brought back, but so was their language. They speak Hebrew in Israel today. Why? Why? Because God not only brought the people back, He brought the same language that King David spoke, they speak today. I mean, they had to add a few words. They couldn't ask David how to say helicopter, but they figured out how to, uh, they made up some, some Hebrew things to fix that. But, but, but it's the same language. Why is that so significant? Because no other people group in all of history can make that claim. No other people group. Other, other people groups were destroyed and scattered. They get absorbed by the local culture and that's it. They're gone. But Israel has this amazing story and it was prophesied long in advance. We're at the end of the last days. Verse 22. So people of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him as you well know. 
Most people that you meet, most of your friends around that Easter table or that Thanksgiving table, they have heard that Jesus did miracles. They have heard that Jesus, well, yeah, he died on the cross for the sins of the world or something and rose again from the dead. They'll even say that. They have heard of it. They just never really thought it through. The miracles that Yeshua did are miracles only God can do. The God from which everything gains its existence, only he could do those kinds of things. Only he can transcend nature itself. But Yeshua did that. He was attesting. This is the man from God because of all of those miracles. And yes, he was crucified on the cross, but, verse 23, God knew what would happen and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. That was part of the plan. And with the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life because death could not keep him in its grip. I believe this because I have the, the best eyewitness testimony ever written in any language. I believe this because the existence of God can be demonstrated both scientifically and biblically. I believe this because these prophecies written thousands of years in advance came to pass within the lifetime of people we know. I don't believe this because it's a cleverly devised fable. I, I don't believe this because it makes me feel good because sometimes it doesn't. And, and I don't believe this because my mother does. I believe it because the evidence adds up. And when you share that with him, and, and you... And, and, it can make a gigantic difference. And, it, you know, and, and you can explain right here, verse 23, God knew this would happen. It's a prearranged plan. In other words, Jesus died on the cross very specifically for you and for me. But what does that mean? And you can go back and you can say, well, look, remember what, what I said at the beginning. God has no beginning and no end. He is the first cause of, of all other effects in this universe. But an effect can only have what it has if it gets it from the cause. So you have a personality, therefore God does. You are a person, an individual, because God is. Anything you have, God is. Now, right there, you're going to get somebody like the New York Times uh, reporting this morning. And they're going to say, well, God must be evil because there's evil in the world. And you're saying that we can't have anything unless God is that in a, in, in a pure sense. And go, hold your horses. Evil is not a thing. It is only ever a lack of something. Let's think about it for a second. How many of you have ever told a lie? Anybody? Okay, the people without your hands up, you're all liars. Let's try that again. How many of you have ever told a lie? Okay, what is a lie? A lie is a lack of truth. It's not a thing. It's a lack of something. It's a lack of truth. How many of you have ever stolen something? I know I have. I don't care if it's a paper clip. You've stolen something? Okay, that's a lack of integrity. And the list goes on. Anything you, you, you label as evil is only ever a lack. God is all of those things. God is absolute truth. He does not lack anything. Therefore, God does not lie. Lies are not a thing. They're a lack of something. And so when, when we look at it that way, we recognize what the Bible is saying when it explains that if you rebel against who God is and who God made you to be, it creates a distance or a separation between you and God. Because God does not lack truth, but you are a liar. Therefore, there's going to be a separation. It's going to cause a relationship rift because of that. It, it, it damages, destroys relationship. And the Bible says, that's what the, the Bible labels all of those things as sin. Sin is the word it uses for anything that God, you know, anything you lack that God has. And that sin creates a separation. That's why the Bible says the wages of sin is death because God is life itself. God is life itself. So if you are separated from God, 
then you are separated from life. And that's the very definition of death. The wages of sin is death. But you see, it was God's prearranged plan here. It was His plan. It was His plan that, that God would die in your place in order for this separation to be fixed. God allowed Yeshua to die in your place so that He could be the perfect substitute for your imperfect life. That's the basis of the entire Christian faith right there. It's everything we believe. Now, verse 25 is going to get some Jewish background here, so when you read it, you might have to explain. For example, it says King David. You might have to say, well, David was the, the, the big hero in, in Jewish history, kind of like our Lincoln or, or Washington to us. So King David said this about him, about Jesus, about the Messiah, the promised one, the God-man. Explain that. Well, this is what David said. I see that the Lord is always with me. I'll, I will not be shaken because he's right beside me. No, no wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. Why? Because you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. So now Peter's going to explain that set of verses. He says, dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David, he wasn't referring to himself when he wrote those things. Because he died, he was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet. And he knew that God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. He'd be king. And David was looking into the future. He was speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was speaking several thousand years, well, more than, little, about a thousand years before Jesus. He was speaking about Jesus rising from the dead. That's, he was a prophet. He was saying that God would not leave Jesus among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead. And we're all eyewitnesses of this. And again, you can go into it and you can say, listen, Plato, I've got you to understand. I said it before. I don't believe this just because it's the religious thing that maybe we grew up with in this family. That's not it. It's because these eyewitnesses, these, these eyewitness accounts, think about it for a second. Over 500 saw Yeshua alive. They'd watched it. They'd watched him beaten beyond recognition and died. But he rose again from the grave and they saw him. They heard him. They touched him. They listened to him. I mean, just, just let that sink in. Because those 500 witnesses, history tells us, they went off and they, they went to spread the news about Yeshua, about Jesus. And wherever they went, they ran into opposition. People killed them, tortured them, crucified them, burned them alive, threw them to lions. And there is not one record anywhere that even one of those witnesses ever recanted and said it's not true. Now, now look, friend, I'm telling you the truth. People, normal people do not die for something when they know it's not true. They don't do that. I mean, this, this eyewitness testimony is overwhelming. It's why I believe what I believe. Because the evidence is so powerful. Verse 23. So now Jesus is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, that's God, as He had promised, gave Him the Holy Spirit to pour out on us just as you see in here today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. In other words, God said that Jesus went back to heaven and He's going to be there until... God humbles all opposition against Jesus. When Jesus returns, all of his enemies, anybody opposed to him, will be a footstool under his feet. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Yeshua, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. And Peter's words pierced their heart. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? 
You see, sometimes you don't know where you're at when you're, when you're around that Easter table. You just share the word the way Peter did. And if the Holy Spirit's working on somebody, those words will pierce their heart. It's not you. It's not your apologetics. It's not your delivery. It's just you sharing the word. Here's what it says. Here's what, it's mean, what it means. And let the Holy Spirit do the work. That's what you need to do. So Peter replies and he says, well, each of you must repent for your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So his answer is you need to repent. And then he says, be baptized for, the word for there in Greek is ice and it means in view of or because of. In other words, you, you, you repent and believe and then because you've repented and believed, you go out and publicly demonstrate to everybody by being dipped in this water and coming out, hey, I've washed away my old life and, I, and, I, and I, I've washed it all away and I follow Jesus. So it's not the baptism that saves you. It's the repentance and the turning to God that saves you. But what does the word repent mean? Because this, this I think, you know, a lot of people think that the word repent means to feel bad about. But how many of you know that even serial killers will occasionally feel bad about something? You know, maybe not murder, but, but they'll feel bad about something. No, it's not feelings. It's not feeling bad about. The word repent is metanoia in Greek, and it means to turn around or to change directions. However, here in this verse, it says metanoeo. Now, that's a different tense for metanoia. This is a continuous in other words what he's saying is is that you you change directions where you are now continually all the time 24 7 you are constantly turning back to yeshua you are constantly turning away from anything that does not look godly and you are turning towards him if you mess up you confess it and you, you say, Lord, forgive me, please, and, and you continue to follow him. You are constantly growing. You are constantly getting rid of things in your life that do not look like him. It becomes your life. You are all in. It is all him in your life. This is not half-hearted. This is not halfway. This is not what I believe. Look, the devil believes. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about repent. And when you explain that to Plato, you know, maybe he'll repent on the spot. Maybe he won't. It doesn't matter. Your responsibility before the Lord is simply to share it. And if you share it by using the Word of God, then God can and often will work through those words and pierce the heart that you could never pierce by any argument. Because I know if you're anything like me, you've got people in your family that you just agonize over. You so badly wish they would be saved. How many of you have got family like that? How many of you got friends like that? Because I do. I mean, they'll break my heart. I want them to get saved so bad. And you just, you just think, if I just say the right thing, if I, if I just answer the right question... I know your heart, my friend, because I have the same heart. But where did you get that heart? <laughs> you got it from God. Holy Spirit in you. Listen, the Holy Spirit longs for people to turn to Him as well. But He will not violate free will. He'll work on somebody. He'll soften their heart. But in the end, you choose. In the end, you have to choose. And you see, what I'm, what I'm going to encourage you to do is that when you get around the Easter table, maybe even today, and that cousin, that friend, that family member is going to challenge that you're the Jesus freak, or maybe they'll bring up the New York Times editorial that was out there today, or, or whatever it happens to be. Remember this. Your responsibility is to share the truth about Easter by sharing, well, Acts chapter 2 is a way to do it, because faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the Word of God. And when you just simply share the Word of God, this is what it says, this is what it means. Let God be God and do the work. But here, this morning, Easter, there are two groups of people here. A lot of you are Christians. You've been a Christian a long time. 
And I am hoping that what you learn today is how to share your faith that much better, that much easier by using the word of God to do it and letting God do the work. But if you're not a Christian today and you came because somebody dragged you here and offered you free lunch and that's how it works on Easter, I get it. (laughs) Enjoy the lunch. But remember this, no one gets out of this life alive. No one does. And the world's greatest scientist and the Bible say that in the beginning, God said. In fact, I was listening to a scientist just a couple weeks ago, a physicist, and he was explaining that when you listen out into the universe, you can literally hear what they call the echo of the Big Bang. And it's interesting. The echo of the Big Bang is a sound wave. In the beginning, God said. And we can still hear the echo of his voice bouncing around in the molecules out there in the ether right now. (laughs) <laughs> if I had Herod stand up, he would, because that's cool. The evidence is in, there is God, and you will face him. And so as we end today, I'm just going to pray real quick. If you have not given your heart to Yeshua yet, there's a prayer tent out at the front, and we invite you to stop in there and just talk with them. They'll give you some information about this coming from the Bible. We're not going to have, you know, altar call type of thing. We don't have time, unfortunately. But I invite you to consider all of this. And if this cut you to the heart, Father God, we come before you in Yeshua's name. We worship you. And Father God, I just pray if there's anybody here that you are working on, that you will give them the courage and the wherewithal to go into that prayer tent. And to make a decision. My friend Ernest made his decision for you when he was 49 years old. I know others that gave their hearts to you when they were just kids. It doesn't matter the age. And so, Father God, I pray if there's someone here that you are working on, that you do not let them leave this campus, but that you don't connect them with your servants so that they might begin the journey of eternal life. We pray these things, Father, in Yeshua's mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.